So I want to move on now to a discussion of Deleuze and Guattari's book, A Thousand Plateaus. Um, <clears throat> this is a work of philosophy, and in my opinion, it's one of the greatest works of postmodern philosophy uh, that was published in 1980, and it's the second of the so-called D&G, Deleuze and Guattari uh, combo deals. It was followed with a, uh, a, a small book about Kafka, and then later on a book called What is Philosophy? So they did four books together. And um, it constitutes, we've been looking at Gebser and Spangler, and we've been looking at what I would call uh, macro narratives or, or uh, macro conceptualizations uh, in Gebser and Spangler. And this is the closest thing, I think, at least it's the closest that I have found in postmodern discourse generally that approximates the type of thing uh, that tr traditional grand metaphysicians like Gebser and Spangler were doing. Uh, this is how the same type of thing then is done. Um, after 1960 in philosophy uh, with the rise of the French now. And so Deleuze is part of this great movement that came out of France with all these great intellectuals, Foucault and Alain Badiou and Paul Virilio and Jean Baudrillard and Michel Serre, all these great French intellectuals. Uh, and so this is one of the great works that comes out of this movement. I just want to go ahead and move right into it. The book is called A Thousand Plateaus because the plateau uh, Deleuze and Guattari will introduce the concept of the rhizome, uh, and the rhizome is a, a way in which multiplicities connect together uh, on, a, on a non stratified plane of consistency. It's the way that they connect together. And a plateau is something that is a type of intensity that is held without beginning or end. It's not something that develops toward a climax, and as a result of that, this is a book that is structured. Uh, Thousand and One Nights is a metaphor for just a lot of, you know, a big amount of time. So A Thousand Plateaus is a book constructed of all of these chapters that they refer to as plateaus that don't develop an argument. The book can be read in any order. The chapters can be read in any order. Um, I prefer to read it through from beginning to end, but um, they don't develop an argument. It's not a traditional book in any sense. In many ways, it's a kind of work of anti-philosophy since it subverts all the traditional uh, philosophical conventions for linear argumentation and the postulation of a thesis and the development of it uh, with examples and then the arrival at a conclusion at the end, uh, it eschews all of that kind of thinking. So, A Thousand Plateaus. Um, and then the opening chapter here is, uh, they label it an introduction as they say just for laughs. They keep some of the conventions of having an introduction and a conclusion as they say just for laughs. Um, but they don't really mean it. Uh, the book isn't written in a circle or in any type of traditional uh, linear narrative. And the introduction introduces the concept of the rhizome. It's called uh, Introduction Rhizome. And uh, the concept of a rhizome is uh, a rhizome is, is what you get uh, with a type of root that develops underneath the soil that ramifies and develops in a lateral way such that it connects with all these other roots and they grow in a lateral way without a center or a periphery. So a rhizome is acentered, it's anti-hierarchical, there is no hierarchy involved, there is no beginning or end, there is no middle, there is no periphery, uh, it's just a, an assemblage of multiplicities. And so they're going to oppose the model of the rhizome. Uh, certain plants that grow like a rhizome are plants like ginger, uh, irises, and violets. Certain plants have this rhizomatic structure. And they're going to oppose the concept of the rhizome by what they call arborescent models. Now, arborescent models are hierarchical models of the center periphery type that build up a sort of strong spinal axis of theory, as it were. Um, and they're the type of models that we've been discussing so far with both Spengler and Gebser. Those are arborescent models. They develop an argument. Um, they have a privileged viewpoint. And um, they're a center periphery type of model, a sort of grand master narrative that overcodes with an over signifying regime that, that strives to dominate other regimes. One of the points of the rhizome is that it doesn't have an over signifying regime that overcodes and subjects other uh, regimes of signs to it. Uh, there is no privileged point of view in a rhizome, and so it's a perfect analog for uh, the way truth is thought of in postmodern thinking. No position can be said anymore 
to be privileged over any of the others. And so we can have no grand metaphysicians who pretend to have access or insight into some ultimate uh, truth from the top of a mountain, let's say, which is a classical image of, of this type of metaphysical thinking, where they can look out upon the terrain uh, and develop, you know, what is sort of ultimate, final, dogmatic point of view to which everything else is subordinated. So they eschew all of that. Those are arborescent models. It is interesting, though, th to note that both Spangler and Gebser draw uh, from plants as their central metaphor. With Spangler, we had seen how he had conceived of civilization as a sort of gigantic plant that goes through a predetermined life cycle, flowers, withers, and dies, and that Gebser, too, with his idea of the gradual phases of the awakening of consciousness to the daylight, uh, suggests, not consciously, I don't think on his part, but it suggests the opening of a, a lotus, like in the Hindu tradition, upon which the god Brahma sits and sends out the light of consciousness into the four directions with his four faces. It, too, is rather plant-like, I think. And so, to here, the privileged metaphor is derived from the realm of plants, uh, although in this case a specific type of plants. Uh, plant, uh, plants that form uh, rhizomes uh, that are underneath the surface of things and subvert things uh, that the dominator structures from below. So uh, there are six basic principles to a rhizome that th they outline in this chapter. And the first of them is the principle of connection. So the first thing about a rhizome is that it can connect, any point can connect with anything else. Uh, there is no privileged center. Uh, and rhizomes develop by connecting, uh, almost like the axons and dendrites in the brain. They simply connect at multiple points, and they keep on connecting. And as they connect, uh, they can add further dimensions. And with the increase in dimensions, uh, rhizomes are made up of what Deleuze and Guattari call multiplicities. Uh, and the, if you increase dimensions on a multiplicity, gradually you, it gives rise to larger and larger assemblages. Now, an assemblage is the key idea in this book, uh, and so it's the key thing to understand, this use of the word assemblage, and it's characteristic of Deleuze all throughout. I think it's first introduced in this book. It wasn't in Difference in Repetition, and I don't remember it from Anti-Oedipus. But an assemblage is simply uh, the means whereby, in culture, uh, things are connected together. And there are two types of assemblages. There are machinic assemblages, which have to do with material and social flows, and there are uh, collective assemblages of enunciation which have to do with sign regimes, or in other words, uh, linguistics and language. So we have uh, assemblages of enunciation and we have machinic assemblages. Uh, an example of an assemblage might be, let's say, during the, the period of chivalry, the man-woman assemblage is an assemblage that holds that chivalric period together. Uh, the nomad is composed up out of a man-horse, uh, sort of centauric assemblage. Um, and so assemblages are the main thing that fascinates Deleuze and Guattari. And notice now that by contrast with Foucault, <clears throat> I remember Deleuze being asked in an interview how he differed and where he differed from Foucault. 